Hi everyone, welcome to your online lecture for the course Human Anatomy and Physiology. In today's lecture, we're covering the reproductive system. The term gonads refers to the primary sex organs in both males and females. So that would be the testes in males and the ovaries in females. And the purpose of the gonads is to produce what are called gametes, also known as sex cells. In addition, they have a, another important purpose, which is the secretion of very important hormones. And we'll look at those a little bit later. The gametes in males are referred to as the sperm and in female are referred to as the ova, or as you would know of it, called the egg. On this slide, we will begin by reviewing the anatomy of the male reproductive system. You can see here, we have the testes and the testes contain sperm. We have this duct system, and the duct system is where sperm and the fluid that it resides in is going to travel. So we have the epididymis, and we'll look closer at this on an upcoming slide, the epididymis, and then we have the ductus or vas deferens, and then as we move through here, now we have the urethra. So I'll highlight here the vas deferens, the epididymis, as well as the urethra. The accessory organs, so we're referring to those organs that assist and contribute to the, the seminal fluid, are the seminal glands, the prostate, and the bulbourethral glands. We'll look at those a little bit closer coming up. And then external genitalia include the penis and the scrotum. So uh, penis here, of course, and scrotum here around the testes. This is just another view for you. We have, to put things into perspective, the urinary bladder, which if we look at this slide, here's the urinary bladder, but from a different perspective, we have the urinary bladder, here's the urethra, We'll talk about the prostate as well that surrounds the urethra. These are the two structures called the ureters, which come from the kidneys and bring urine into the bladder. Now each testy is connected to the trunk by what's called a spermatic cord. And so here's the spermatic cord here. Here's your testes, and you can see within this cord, we have blood vessels represented by red and blue. There are nerves represented through here by the color yellow, and then there is also what's referred to as the ductus deferens. And the ductus deferens is here, or the vas deferens, and you can see its origination here, and we can sort of follow it through. It's quite coiled where it changes its name, as we'll see shortly, to the epididymis and then enters the testes. If we look closer at the testes itself, you can see all of these coiled structures through here. And these are referred to as the seminiferous tubules. And the seminiferous tubules, tightly coiled structures, this is where sperm is produced. So if you're asked a question, such as where in the testes is sperm produced, the answer would be within the seminiferous tubules. And then when sperm is produced here, it's going to, it's going to drain into the ready testy. And this is that network region you can see through here. And from here, because it's working its way out now, it's going to go into the epididymis. So now we've gone from the ready testy into the epididymis through here. And then as we continue moving through, you can see that it joins in with the ductus deferens or vas deferens. I also told you that the testes are not only responsible for producing sperm in the seminiferous tubules, but that they're responsible for producing hormones, in particular testosterone. And so it's the interstitial cells that are found within the seminiferous tubules that are going to produce hormones classified as androgens, in particular testosterone. The duct system, as I already told you, is going to be this system that transports sperm and its fluid from the, from the body out of the body. So what we can see here is if we go back to this slide, 
We know that sperm is produced in this region here. It moves from the seminiferous tubules into the ready testi, then it enters the epididymis. So we'll continue with the epididymis on this slide. You can see here's the epididymis, then it's going to enter into the next part, which is the ductus deferens, and it'll continue through here. And different fluid secretions are added along the way to make it more liquid, and then it makes its pathway through the urethra. And so as we'll see shortly, the urethra has two purposes, and that is for the passage of sperm and the passage of urine, but at, of course, different times. So one system shuts off while the other's working. Let's look at the epididymis just a, a little bit closer. It's this tube, as we know here, quite convoluted in terms of its, its design. And this is the first part of the ductal system, as, as you can envision. And it is considered a temporary storage site for immature sperm. So sperm will reside in this region, and then they will migrate through the rest of the ductal system and, or through the rest of the epididymis and mature along their pathway. During ejaculation, though, when sperm is actually going to be moving now through the ductus deferens and out the urethra and pumped out of the body, fluid is added to it along the way. Now onto the ductus deferens or the vas deferens, which you can see here from the epididymis, and then it would continue to pass through all the way until we get to the urethra. There is an ejaculatory duct, which I'll highlight here, present here. And so you can see that sperm is going to move through here, move through the vas deferens, pass through to the ejaculatory duct. And this ejaculatory duct region is almost an area where the vas deferens will join in with the urethra. And sperm move by the process of peristalsis, and we learned about this term when we spoke about the digestive system, and that's that propelling forward movement of a substance. I'm sure you've heard of the term vasectomy. So if you break down this term, we have vas referring to the vas deferens and ectomy meaning removal of. So they actually cut the vas deferens or the ductus deferens at the level of the testes in order to prevent the transportation of sperm. So sperm can't go from where they're produced, so they are still produced, but where they're produced out the body. And so of course this is a, a form of birth control. The urethra extends from the urinary bladder to the tip of the penis, so we can see the bladder here and the urethra through here. And as mentioned already, it contains, carries both urine and sperm at different times, and sperm will enter the urethra from the ejaculatory duct as introduced on the previous slide. Ejaculation causes the internal urethra sphincter to close. And this is important because it during ejaculation you want to prevent urine from being able to pass into the urethra from the bladder, but you also want to prevent sperm from being able to enter into the urinary bladder as well, so it can act as two completely separate passageways at different times. And so that term sphincter, which we've spoken about before, is sort of it's a passageway but designed to be kind of a one-way one-way passage system. The accessory glands and semen is the next discussion, and the accessory glands that contribute to the formation of semen include the seminal vesicles, the prostate, and the bulbourethral glands. We introduced these at the beginning of the lecture. And so all three of these, once again, accessory glands that are going to be really adding fluid and adding certain substances to the sperm to make it what it is. And we can look at these here, we have the seminal vesicle, we have the prostate, and we have the bubble urethral glands here. And so you can see their difference in appearance. We'll look at them a little bit closer in terms of what their role is. First of all, the seminal vesicles they, let's highlight that here, 
They are located at the base of the bladder, which you can see in this image, and they're gonna produce this thick yellowish secretion. But what I'd really like you to know about this one is that it contributes to the majority of the semen its contribution to the semen, it contributes the majority of it. And it also contains nutrients that are very important for survival and health of the sperm. The prostate, this encircles the urethra. So you can see the urethra, this part of the urethra through here, the urethra then passes through the prostate. So individuals that have inflamed prostates or prostate cancers will have a lot of pressure put on their urethra which can make urination difficult because urine has a difficult time getting from the bladder past the inflamed or enlarged prostate in order to get it out of the body. And the prostate is going to secrete a milky fluid and one of the important features of the prostate fluid that's contributed is it helps to really activate the sperm. The bulbal urethral glands, you can see they look like P-shaped glands. They're found beneath the prostate. So you can see the order then that as sperm is traveling through here, first it's going to have contributions from the seminal vesicle, then from the prostate, then from the bulbal urethral glands. And it's going to produce a thick, clear mucus. And one of the main roles of this is going to be to help cleanse the urethra of any acidic urine that's there prior to ejaculation because the acidic urine can is, is not a healthy environment for the sperm to be in. The mucus that's produced as well is going to serve as a lubricant during sexual intercourse to optimize the overall goal, which is, is fertilization. And this is an image for you to have a little bit more of a closer look. So once again, we have sperm produced here. Then it's going to enter the epididymis, that temporary storage site. Then it's going to enter the, the ductus deferens or the vas deferens. And it's at this level that a vasectomy would be performed. We're going to move upwards alongside the bladder. Then we reach the level of the seminal vesicle that's going to contribute some additional fluid. Here we're now at the level of the ejaculatory duct. We pass through here and the prostate's going to contribute its secretions, continue to pass along. Here we have the bulbal urethral gland which will contribute secretions. And then the final product of course will continue to pass through the urethra. And just another view of the different glands. So you can see, actually you can see the ejaculatory duct here and how it looks from this view, the seminal vesicles. You can also see the prostate and this gives you a really good idea about how the urethra passes through the prostate. So you could probably very much envision if this was inflamed how it would impede urine flow from the bladder um, towards the direction of being able to get out of the body. And then we can also see the bubble urethral glands, those P-shaped glands here. Now we'll look at external genitalia, so the scrotum and the penis. The scrotum is the sac of skin that's actually found outside the abdomen and it houses the testes. So the testes then are housed within the scrotum. When you're in utero and even upwards to the first year of life, the testes are in your abdomen and that's where they form. And then when you're, when you're born, or at least by the first year of life, the testes should descend from your abdomen and end up within the scrotum. So it's important for medical doctors and family doctors to be checking the scrotum to make sure that the testes is actually residing inside. And this is important because if the testes remains inside the body, then the sperm that would be produce, produced and the structures that actually produce the sperm can be damaged because of how our body core body temperature, how high our core body temperature is. That's why the testes are found outside the body. In contrast with the ovaries, as we'll see in a female, which of course always reside within the pelvic cavity. So the, the scrotum then helps keep the sperm at a viable, so a survivable really temperature, maintaining the testes at about three degrees Celsius lower than normal body temperature. And you know, that seems minor, but it makes all the difference in the uh, fertility of a male. 
The penis, we know, is the male organ that's involved in sexual intercourse, so that's what copulation means, and it delivers sperm into the female reproductive tract, and so this, of course, is its reproductive function, and the regions that you can see here include the shaft, the glands penis, so that would be the enlarged part at the end, and the prepus, or the foreskin, is the folded cuff around the, the proximal end, and it's oftentimes removed in individuals that have circumcisions. Spermatogenesis. This is the development, so genesis, formation of sperm. The chief role of the male reproductive tract, we know with the testes is to produce sperm, but also pr to produce testosterone. Sperm production, and this is important because it's different than females when it comes to eggs, actually begins at puberty, puberty and can continue until very, very late adult life. And millions of sperm are made every day. So a lot of sperm is, is produced every day. And even still, for fertility or fertilization can still be difficult for some people. Sperm are formed, we know, in the seminiferous tubules of the testes. And the process begin, begins by spermatogonia, which are the primitive stem, sperm stem cells, are going to begin dividing rapidly. An important point to also make here is that during puberty, follicle-stimulating hormone, which we talked about in the endocrine system, is going to be secreted in increasing amounts, contributing to this process now of developing sperm at puberty. The term meiosis is different than mitosis. Meiosis is a very special type of nuclear division that occurs in the gonads. And it, what's interesting about it is it includes two successive divisions of the nucleus. So we have meiosis one and meiosis two. And the real purpose of this is to produce a gamete that has 23 chromosomes. So in the normal cells in our body, we have 46 chromosomes. But of this, 23 came from the mom and 23 came from the dad. And so when we have a sperm and we have an egg, when they unite, we want them to have a total of 46 chromosomes forming the, the baby or what we'll see is called a zygote. So individually then it's important that they only have 23 chromosomes each so that when they come together they form the total 46 chromosomes that are found in all of the different cells in the body with the exception of the gametes. So that's really important for you to understand. And it's called a haploid cell because it contains half the number of, of chromosomes that is normally found in every other cell in our body, which every other cell in our body is called a diploid cell. So a haploid cell then is one that contains 23 chromosomes, so gametes, and a diploid cell contains 46 chromosomes. And again, that's all the other cells that are found within our body, with the exception of the gametes, which we know are called the sex cells. The process of meiosis though, when we're creating sperm, is going to produce four daughter cells, or four gametes, or four sperm cells. So what you can see here is really what I've already explained to you is that we have 23 chromosomes found in the egg and 23 chromosomes found in the sperm. When they unite, which is called fertilization, we form a zygote. So when, a, when two gametes, egg and sperm, come together, they form a zygote, which would have 46 chromosomes. This shows you the different parts of a sperm. We have the head, the midpiece, and the tail. And I'd like you to be aware of not what these look like, but just the different, these three words that I'm circling here. And the main role of each, you should also be aware of. So what we have here is a tail that provides mobility, and that makes sense, the movement. The midpiece, all I'd like you to be aware of is that it contains mitochondria, and mitochondria we know give energy, that powerhouse of the cell. And then the head contains the nucleus.
So during puberty, we have already mentioned that follicle stimulating hormone is going to be secreted in increasing amounts. But what I need you to be aware of is that it's follicle stimulating hormone that is what is responsible for the initiation of sperm production by those seminiferous tubules. And that luteinizing hormone is going to allow for the production of testosterone. And remember, testosterone is produced by the interstitial cells, as mentioned on a previous slide. Testosterone is the most important hormonal product of the testes, which is why we're discussing it as the main hormone. It's going to stimulate reproductive organ development. It's involved in sex drive. It's also involved in secondary sex characteristics. So we're talking about characteristics that are secondary because they're not directly involved in the production of, a, of sperm. So deepening of the voice, increased hair growth, enlargement of skeletal muscles, increased bone growth and density, all things that you would associate with boys that enter puberty. Now we're moving on to the female reproductive system. The ovaries, as mentioned, produce the egg, which is called the ova. And just like the testes produce hormones, the ovaries do as well. And the two hormones that you need to be aware of are estrogen and progesterone that are produced by the ovaries. Each ovary, there are two in most females, contain what are called ovarian follicles. And we'll see what these look like on a next slide, but what they contain is the oocyte, that means immature egg, as well as follicle cells that surround it. So we have, we'll, we'll see this coming up, but you have an oocyte, and then you have these follicular cells that, that surround it. Just like the males have a duct system, this pathway that the sperm can travel, females have a duct system for the egg to travel to. And so our ductal female ductal system consists of the fallopian tubes, also known as the uterine tubes, the uterus itself, and the vagina. So we'll look at here the fallopian tubes you can see here called the uterine tubes. We have the ovary and we have the uterus itself. So here's the uterus where a baby would grow. This is also where menstruation occurs. And then here's the passageway here of where a baby would be born. So we have the vagina and once again, the fallopian tube and the ovary. And as you'll see shortly, what happens is the ovaries are gonna produce the egg, which will end up in the fallopian tube and then will reach the uterus. And then of course, external genitalia as well. So what are ovarian follicles? Well, what you need to be aware of if we look at the inside the ovary itself, what I'd like you to notice is this term here, primary follicle. The primary follicle contains, if you look closely within it, an immature oocyte. And as it matures, you can see it's growing, continuing to grow. And then it grows to a particular size where it changes its name because it's now mature to this vesicular follicle or graphene follicle. And then it's going to be merging quite a bit here with the actual wall of the ovary. And then what you can see happening if you're following along the arrows here is that it merges with the wall and it releases the oocyte, what's called a secondary oocyte. And this release here of the oocyte is what's called ovulation. So when it ruptures out of the ovary, this is the process referred to as ovulation, where a female releases an egg every month, and that egg could be fertilized by a sperm. So that's that process of ovulation. That occurs approximately every 28 days, but there's quite variation to that. Then the last point on this slide to make is that after the egg is released, notice here that the entire graphene follicle doesn't leave. It only is going to dispel what's called the secondary oocyte and leave behind this structure. And this structure, if we're moving now and following the arrows, starts to change its, its appearance. And it forms what's called a corpus luteum. You can see that final product here. And a corpus luteum, as we'll see shortly, 
If a female is pregnant, so if this egg is fertilized, this corpus luteum is going to hang around and it's going to produce hormones to help sustain the pregnancy. But most of the time when women release an egg, it doesn't actually get fertilized. And so what will then happen is this corpus luteum doesn't need to hang around and instead it will degrade and it will form a what's called a corpus albican. So I'll just write that out here because it's not written on the slide. Corpus albican. This shows you another view of the re female reproductive system. So what we have here is an ovary that would produce an egg. The egg would eventually mature, it would rupture out of the ovary, and then it gets sweeped into by these long projections, sweeped into the fallopian tube. And as we'll see shortly, fertilization usually occurs in this region, not the uterus. But if it is fertilized, or even if not, it can continue its movement through here, entering into the uterus, where if fertilization happened, then it would implant itself, as we'll see, into the wall of the uterus. And this is where the baby would be growing. And so this structure will enlarge greatly through pregnancy to accommodate a growing baby. And then we have here this cervix, which is really the, the passageway or the junction between the uterus and the vagina. And so then if this area would widen during childbirth to allow for the passage of the baby out of the body. The fallopian tubes, as already discussed, there are these structures here. They're going to receive the oocyte site that has been released from the ovaries. I told you that it's a site for fertilization that they empty into the uterus. But what's interesting is there's little or really no contact between the ovary and the uterine tube. So they're actually separate and distinct. So it is possible that when an egg is released from the ovary, that it might not even make its way into the uterine tube. Sometimes it can, it can go in other areas of the body and it can even be fertilized in other areas of the body as well. And uh, this can be concerning if it grows and that's called an ectopic pregnancy, which you may have heard of before. The structure, the two main points I'd like you to be aware of is the infundibulum of the uterine tube. And so it's shown on this image here a little bit easier, but this is the, the really the opening to the uterine tube. And the term fimbrae are the projections, the finger-like projections that you can see off here. And what they do is they, they, they sweep the egg almost like a broom from the ovary into the uterine tube. And then what you can't see on here is there's these little cilia Remember that term, cilia are found inside the uterine tube and they're going to encourage moving the egg in this direction, especially once it's fertilized. And that helps prevent it from actually embedding itself in the wall of the fallopian tube because if that happens then, and, that, and that's also an ectopic pregnancy and it's very dangerous because there's no room for a baby to grow in this region. So sperm, when sperm enters the vagina, it will travel and be attracted to the egg and usually fertilize the egg in the fallopian tube. Okay, the uterus. It is going to receive, retain, and nourish the fertilized egg. So let's say fertilization of the sperm to the egg occurs here. It's going to mature and change, travel through here, and then it's going to embed itself in the wall and the uterus will retain it and nourish it for the rest of the pregnancy. The three structures that make up the uterus or the anatomy that you need to be aware of, speaking generally, include the, the body, which is the main portion of the uterus. So that's this whole structure here is the uterus. So we have the body of the uterus. We have the fundus, which is the top part of the uterus. And we have the cervix, which is the lower part of the uterus. There are three layers to be aware of. 
and you can see they contribute to the wall of the uterus. We have the endometrium, the myometrium, and the perimetrium. So starting from the most inner, we have endometrium, then we have myometrium, and then the most external, peri, meaning around, perimetrium. The endometrial layer, the inner layer, is the mucosa layer, and this is where implantation is going to occur. And it is also what sloughs off if pregnancy does not occur through the process of menstruation. So the bleeding that occurs during menstruation is because of the endometrial layer shedding. You may have heard of the condition called, especially as a female, called endometriosis. And this involves this endometrial tissue, that inner layer. The myometrium, remember myo means muscle. It's smooth muscle because it's something we don't have voluntary control over. And it will contract to help extract, to help get the baby out during delivery. Sometimes women that have a lot of crampiness during, during their men, menstruation, their smooth muscle of their uterus could be could be contracting. And then the perimetrium is that outermost layer. And most outer layers are, are a serous layer that are continuous with a lot of other outer layers of other organs in our body, keeping everything kind of together, but allowing them to move nicely on their own. The vagina is the passageway that extends from the cervix, so the cervix, to the exterior of the body. And it's located between the urinary bladder and the rectum. So if you look at this image here, here's the posterior part and we have the rectum here. And then the anterior part, we have the bladder. So you can see that it's found in between the two. And it would make sense because here's the anus and here is the urethral opening for urination and then the vagina in between. Of course, it's the female organ of copulation or sexual intercourse uh, just like the penises, and it also serves for delivery of a baby and menstrual flow. A hymen, this is a structure that partially closes the vagina until it's ruptured, and this can be ruptured at first intercourse, but it can also be ruptured if you have very active young girls that are in gymnastics and in certain sports, their hymen can be ruptured well before they've even had intercourse. It used to be a sign that if a female's hymen was ruptured, it meant that she is no longer a virgin, but it's been found for quite some time now that that is not the case. But in certain cultures, it's still believed to be that way. The external genitalia, we're not going to go into the details of what each of these are involved in, but we have the mons pubis, which is this elevated kind of, it really fatty part at the top here. We have the labia, so labia majora and minora around this region, the clitoris, which actually has much more function in terms of, of very similar features as the erectile tissue does in men, contains actually very similar tissue. The urethral orifice, this is orifice being opening, so this is the opening where urination would occur. And then we have the vaginal orifice as well, and then the vestibular glands. And the vestibular glands, which aren't very evident in this image, they're deeper within, but they're going to produce secretions for lubrication. Now, unlike the male, which will produce their sperm at puberty, and this is a very important distinction, is the total supply of eggs for a female is determined by the time a female is born. In other words, when a female is born, a newborn baby, she has all the eggs that she'll ever have already produced. But they're not mature eggs, they can't be fertilized. So the ability to actually release eggs is going to begin at puberty with the onset of the menstrual cycle. So when a female has her first menstrual, menstrual cycle, then approximately, but not exact, two weeks later, she will ovulate her first egg. Reproductive ability begins at puberty, but it ends at menopause, which can be in and around the females when they are around the age of 50s, then their reproductive ability will cease. So you can, this word here, meno referring to menstrual cycle and pause, meaning it stops. 
but does not pick up. Spermatogenesis was the formation of sperm. Oogenesis is the formation of, of an egg, also called an ova. And primary oocytes are inactive until puberty. So remember when we looked at the ovary and we had said that when ovulation occurs, that's the secondary oocyte. But before that, before ovulation, when a child is pre-puberty, she will have primary oocytes that are found within her ovary, but they're inactive. Follicle stimulating hormone, so you can see its application to both male and female reproduction, is going to cause some of these primary follicles to mature every month. So there's many in there, they won't all mature. And it's the, the cyclic monthly changes that occur with hormones that are going to allow for what's called the ovarian cycle. This slide here just shows you a little bit closer the, the inside of the ovary and that egg production and ovulation which would occur, which is then sweeped by these fimbrae into the infundibulum of the uterine tube, usually fertilized around this region moves then as it matures into the uterus and can implant into, if fertilized, can implant into the uterine wall. The duct system, we've already spoken about, so we'll move right on now to talking about meiosis when it comes to the ovarian cycle or the ovaries. The first meiotic division is going to produce this larger secondary oocyte. And remember, it's that secondary oocyte that's going to actually leave via ovulation. Okay, so ovulation of secondary oocyte. And it occurs because of luteinizing hormone. And we'll look at a, a graph of this shortly, but I really need you to make sure you are aware that ovulation is triggered by luteinizing hormone. And sometimes you'll hear it referred to as LH surge. So when there's this LH surge, so a surge in luteinizing hormone, that's when a female will ovulate. And so if women are trying to get pregnant, they can take what are called ovulation tests so that they have an idea as to when they're ovulating because really there's only a short window that a female can get pregnant. That's why it's called the miracle of life because it's actually not, not that easy to get pregnant believe it or not. So when luteinizing hormone surges, this can be picked up by an ovulation test and can indicate that, okay, there's a spike in luteinizing hormone. A female then should be ovulating within, you know, a, say 24 to 48 hours once this increase has been detected. Now the secondary oocyte is released then via ovulation and it's surrounded by a corona radiate or radiata. And this will be important, we don't get into the details, but the corona radiata which surrounds it will have to be penetrated by the sperm in order for the sperm to fertilize it. And only one sperm, the first sperm that's able to penetrate through this corona radiata will be able to fertilize the egg. Meiosis, though, in females, very important, is only complete after ovulation if a sperm penetrates the oocyte, and that really produces that mature ovum. Okay, so once again, meiosis is only complete if a sperm penetrates the oocyte. Then the secondary oocyte will change over to becoming an ovum, and once it is an ovum, then the 23 chromosomes from the sperm can be dumped into the egg, combining 23 chromosomes from each gamete, forming a total of 46 chromosomes within that fertilized egg. Now, if this secondary oocyte that was released by ovulation is not penetrated by a sperm, then it will die and it does not complete meiosis to form an ovum. So estrogens and progesterone, which we talked about are the hormones that are produced by the ovaries, have different roles. Estrogens are produced by the fol follicular cells or follicle cells that are found within the ovary. 
And progesterone is produced by the corpus luteum. So remember that after ovulation occurs, let's see if we can get to that image briefly. After ovulation occurs, we have that leftover structure that forms that corpus luteum. And I mentioned to you that that corpus luteum is going to hang around to produce hormones such as progesterone to help maintain a pregnancy. Because what progesterone will do is keep the uterus nice and thick, very hospitable to the implantation of a fertilized, of a fertilized egg. And so this will hang around if pregnancy occurs, but if it doesn't, then it dies off and you don't get that continued secretion of progesterone. So that's the role of the corpus luteum then is going to be to help maintain pregnancy. And in the event that the woman is pregnant and it's maintaining pregnancy, it's also going to prepare the breast for milk production, for breastfeeding. Estrogen, though, just like testosterone, contributes to the secondary sex characteristics, whereas progesterone does not play a role with this. So here's a list here of your secondary sex characteristics. So the structures that are not directly involved in, in producing eggs and producing a baby. So you'll have enlargement of some of the accessory organs, development of breasts, pubic and axillary hair, increased fat, which is really important for women of childbearing age, so hips and breasts to accommodate a baby, widening and lightening of the pelvis, more suitable for a growing baby, and of course the onset of menses, so all the things that you would relate to a female in puberty. This slide here shows you the involvement of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, but remember that this surge in luteinizing hormone, which you can see is much greater than that of follicle stimulating hormone, is going to be what signals the event of ovulation. This is a nice summary slide of when we looked at that image that showed you the ovary and how first we have the the primary follicle that will mature and enlarge and become a vesicular or graphene follicle and then it will merge with the uterine wall or rather the ovarian wall and then ovulation release of that that secondary oocyte occurs and then this leftover component here will form the corpus luteum and the corpus luteum is going to be what secretes that hormone progesterone to maintain a pregnancy and keep that uterus nice and thick and, and very hospitable to a fertilized egg. And then if pregnancy does not occur, then the corpus luteum will degenerate and it forms what I had mentioned earlier as the corpus, corpus albican. Okay, corpus albican. And so then what I also need you to be aware of is that this stage of follicular maturation is quite simply called the follicular phase. Then this stage of lute, corpus luteum formation and maintenance is called the, conveniently, the luteal phase. And in between then we have ovulation, which in most cases occurs around day 14. And so that was really the ovarian cycle. So we're talking about the ovary, ovaries and the cycle of ovulation every month. But we also have a uterine cycle. And so the uterine cycle has a lot to do with menstruation. And so I'd like you to be aware of these three phases. We have the menstrual phase, we have the proliferative phase, and the secretory phase. And the name itself will actually help you know what happens. So if don't worry about the days here that are involved. I mean, we have the average 28 days, but don't worry about the, the ranges here. But what I'd like you to be aware of is that during the menstrual phase, this is menstrual flow. During the proliferative phase, this is when the uterus, so this is the uterine lining, and you can just see that it's thickening. It's starting to really, really proliferate and start to enlarge and become functional because it's shed off now it needs to rebuild. Why is it rebuilding? Well, in hopes that an egg will, will be fertilized and implanted into it. And then finally, the secretory phase. 
This phase is where you really get enrichment of the blood supply and granular secretion, just as the name suggests, to really prepare the endometrium to receive that embryo. Hopefully, in, in, or at least it's hoping to. Now, an oocyte, or the egg, is once it's released, is only viable for up to 24 hours. So this is that real super short window for, for ovulation or for getting pregnant. The sperm have up to 48 hours of viability. And sperm have to make their way to the uterine tube, as or the fallopian tube as already discussed, for fertilization to be possible. And the reason they know to travel in that direction, I mean, there's instinct, but there's also chemicals that are released by the egg attracting the sperm to it. Once a sperm reaches the egg, reaches the oocyte, it's going to release or possess these enzymes, the sperm does, that will penetrate and break through that corona radiata, as already mentioned, that's found around the oocyte. So think of it like a, here's the oocyte and it has this layer around it. And an egg, a sperm is going to have to release these enzymes in order to penetrate through it in order to actually penetrate the egg itself and be able to dump its DNA into the egg. So 23 chromosomes from the sperm and 23 from the egg, allowing for this finalized fertilized product called a zygote, which will have 46 chromosomes. And so it undergoes this acrosomal or acrosomal reaction and I don't want you to worry about this term because we're not going into enough detail about it for it to be relevant. And then we know that the oocyte is going to undergo this second meiotic division now that it's been fertilized or penetrated by the sperm to produce what we know is called an ovum. And the polar body is also a topic that we're not getting into in this course. So you don't have to concern yourself with that either. Okay, let's summarize what you need to know about this image here. First of all, here is a nice image of our ovary showing you the release of an egg. When the egg is released, the fimbrae, so we're kind of putting everything together now, the fimbrae of the uterine tube is going to act as a broom and sweep that oocyte, the egg, into the fallopian tube. I told you that usually in, it's really this outer third region of the fallopian tube. Remember, this is the infundibulum. This region here is usually the area of fertilization. So here's a sperm that has met the egg and fertilized it. So it's penetrated through that corona radiata. You can see actually lots of sperm here, but only one will, will win, win the race. If you had two that fertilized it, it would be, you'd end up having double the amount of chromosomes entering into that that egg and it would not survive then as it it's so here it's it's fertilized it's going to migrate and the cilia present in the in the fallopian tube is going to encourage this movement in this direction what I'd like you to be aware of is that lots of things are happening. You can see all the, the divisions and changes and the amount of cells that are increasing but once it's called a zygote, it travels through the uterine tube. A lot of changes occur, and we have the marula formed. The marula is going to travel towards the uterus, and it changes its name to a blastocyst. So you don't have to worry about early versus implanting, but I'd like you to be aware that we go from an oocyte that becomes fertilized by a, a sperm and becomes a zygote. Then as it changes and, and matures, it changes its name to a marula. As it continues to mature, it changes its name to the blastocyst, which is usually once we've approached the uterus. And then you can see it embedding itself within the endometrial layer. So this layer here, this is the muscular layer here, within the endometrial layer of the uterus. And it's at around this level here that the placenta will form as we'll talk about next. 
The placenta, this forms a barrier between the mother and the embryo. So blood is not exchanged, but the nutrients from the mother and oxygen from the mother, her blood is going to enter into the, the embryo. And then the embryo, its waste products are going to enter into the mum. Allow, the mum's placenta is going to help remove that. Then the placenta also becomes an endocrine organ. So remember that the corpus luteum initially is going to be producing progesterone to maintain the pregnancy as one of its main hormones. But then once the placenta develops, and this is usually by the end of the second month, the corpus luteum, it's done its job. Now the placenta can take over and it's going to produce hormones such as estrogen and progesterone as well as as pregnancy hormones that you don't need to be aware of, but you may have heard of called human chorionic gonadotropin hormone or HCGH. That's the hormone that pregnancy tests will detect in urine when taking a pregnancy test. So the placenta takes over the role of the corpus luteum by about the end of the second month of pregnancy. Just a little bit about the mammary glands. They are present in both sexes, but they function only in females. They're actually a modified sweat gland. So mammary glands are found within the breast and their purpose is to produce milk to nourish a newborn baby uh, and to provide them with many of the nutrients and antibodies that they need, especially for the first six months of life. And they're stimulated by sex hormones, so mostly estrogen as we already discussed in order to increase the size so that the body can start uh, housing and producing milk. Remember, we talked about hormones such as prolactin and oxytocin earlier in the term. In order to look at the anatomy of the mammary gland, we'll cover the, the basics here. This central pigmented area around the, so this is the nipple, around the nipple is called the areola. Then if we look inside, we can see that there are lobes and lobules. Lobules are really smaller lo lobes that are found within the lobes. And then we have alveolar glands. This is where we produce, females produce milk when a woman is lactating or breastfeeding. There are lactiferous ducts that connect the, these alveolar glands to the actual nipple to allow for milk to move from where it's been produced out of the breast. And the lactiferous silent sinus is where milk accumulates. And it's hard to envision here, but what a baby will do if you can see these lactiferous sinuses here is they will compress these and this will, when they they suckle and it will allow for milk to leave that region and enter the baby's mouth. Now, as far as details of what these anatomical structures do, what I would like you to be aware of is that it's the alveolar glands that produce milk when a woman is lactating. And finally, Finishing off with a biomedical device that's relevant to part of today's lecture is mammography. So this is referring to the breasts, which we just discussed. And mam mammography is an x-ray examination. It uses, uses low-dose x-ray to try and detect breast cancers, ones that are generally too difficult to feel during a breast exam. And the American Cancer Society recommends it's done between the ages of 45 and 54 years old. And not usually sooner than that because a young female's breast is very dense to begin with. And so looking at a mammogram of a young female, it can look like she has lesions in her breast even though she very well likely may not. In addition, it does expose the breast to, to x-rays. And there is a link to mammography and breast cancer, which seems quite ironic since it's being used to detect breast cancer. But when you're at a certain age, it makes sense when you weigh the risks versus the benefits. And breast cancer is oftentimes signaled by a change in skin texture. So the skin in the breast looks different. There might be a lump that's felt. There could be a puckering of the, the breast, leakage from the nipple. The, the nipple itself can almost look like it's retracted and looks very different usually than the other breast. And this here is showing you a mammogram of a normal breast versus one that has a lesion of breast cancer. 
that is not only the end of this lecture, but the end of all of the lectures for this course. I hope you enjoyed it. Bye for now.